start by saying that I'm delighted to have the opportunity for the first time to, to have a real partnership between industry and a university. Uh, thanks to Nile University, this is the first time, and I really mean it. Uh, let me start by saying, why am I here? And why should I care? Why should industries support research in general? How do we receive ideas that could lead to game-changing process and business innovations for the industry? Why should companies support research in institutions like Nile University? Because no country can afford not having a pool of people capable of running research. Because our main problem in Egypt is we never invested in finding opportunities for research to be applied and the lack of attention paid to R&D. Because the only solution to this is to promote innovation rather than being a user of technology, you can develop the technology. Let me, let me give an example of that. Uh, when, when we all know about Apple, uh, if we see the profitability of Apple, it is by far exceeding a thousand percent, while all the other players in the value chain are between five to 10 percent. Apple created a technology, they innovated. Because of the innovation, they are where they are, and we are just serving. So we are all the servants of Apple. We are all the servants of Toyota. We are all the servants of General Motors, Wahakaza. I wish that someday, through uh, efforts like Nile University, and I really wish to see other universities following the same, <coughs> I really wish to see this country someday uh, uh, able to innovate and create. And because the role of R&D is to give you a competitive edge to differentiate your products, because modern society depends fundamentally on continuing investment and exploitation of new knowledge. It has, it has been proven the investment in R&D raises productivity and generates economic growth and welfare. And simply because we can no longer survive without proper R&D. Did anyone here from the audience, did anyone here about the Volkswagen emission problem? Does anyone have any idea about who and how they discovered it? Simply, there is a Carter team, fee team of researchers, Abaran, a research professor, two graduate students, a faculty member, and an engineer is the answer to the incident that took the global industry and the world by surprise. It was $50,000. Research people, they discovered this uh, scandal. Who we are is, uh, about GB Auto. GB Auto is the largest listed automotive player in the area with operations spanning 10 different businesses and five countries employing over 10,000 people and generating revenues last year of 12.3 or plus 12.3 billion Egyptian pounds. It's a company with a vision for R&D, product design, product inception, and failure analysis. We collaborate with different types of partners at a time, bringing in different sets of knowledge to incorporate new ideas. And we have a live example, our own product designs, Abaran El buses, will trailers, will superstructures. It's our own design. How can industry players like GB Auto offer entities? What can what can industry players like GB Auto offer entities like Nile University? We offer a strategic direction for research. We offer a chance to collaborate, a problem to solve and we offer a chance to apply by implementing the solutions. 
How has GB Auto agreed to cooperate with Nile University? GB Auto staff training, in fact, and cooperation with undergraduate and postgraduate research students to study and implement projects and researches targeting the process development in areas, areas of production. What is the initial scope of agreement in R&D between GB Auto and Nile University? Systems of proper material handling, manipulators, and simple assembly jig design and fabrication, especially for high volume and or high weight parts assembly in confined areas. Systems for error proofing in assembly processes in critical quality areas that highly involve safety and roads. Introducing Nile University research input to GB Auto suppliers. It's not only with GB Auto, we have about 90 suppliers. To widen the added value of research in the manufacturing processes to ensure product quality in the lower tiers of the supply base. Why does the initial agreement between GB Auto and Nile University, what it means? It is an initial step to enrich the R&D function, not only in GB Auto, but in the industry at large. GB Auto can offer university research real life problems that will show the practical ground in the theories to be thought, taught. This will better prepare graduates to be ready for practical and industrial experience, which will in turn serve the national industry. GB Auto will definitely consider Nile University graduates as a high priority pool for, the, for future employment. I will elaborate on the last, this is the last slide. <laughs> what are the challenges? I'm going to talk specifically about automotive industry. What are the challenges automotive industry is facing? We all know that there is no advanced country with strong economy without an automotive manufacturing existing. Yani Europe has it, States has it, Korea has it, China has it, Japan has it. And when you talk about countries, other countries who did not uh, develop their own car or their own brands, <coughs> you'll find lots of examples like Turkey who are really manufacturing a car which was not designed by them. Well, I can they have succeeded to penetrate the industrial, the automotive uh, industry and have over a million car produced per year, generating tens of billions of dollars of foreign currency revenues and employing hundreds of thousands, if I, I would say even millions of employment opportunities. If we look at Middle East and Africa, Egypt was the first country to start automotive industry. And it started in the early 60s through a Nasr company at Wadi Hof. At that time, there was nothing in South Africa, there was nothing in Turkey, and there was absolutely nothing in Morocco. 50 years later, where Egypt is, and where the others are. 50 years later, Egypt is a successful automotive assembler, but it is not an automotive manufacturer. While a country like Morocco, seven years ago, they had nothing. And in seven years, they succeeded to have today a capacity of 600,000 cars, 400,000 from Renault, and 200,000 from, from Peugeot Citroën. I just read, before coming here, a Reuters statement done, or a statement done by their minister, the Moroccan Minister of Industry, to Reuters, saying that by 2020, their exports of cars will exceed $10.2 billion. 
and that the country is striving to uh, increase the output from 600 to above a million cars a year. They just started seven years ago. Look at Turkey. Turkey, in 1962, they had nothing. Nothing. Today, Turkey is producing 1.5 million cars, selling to West Europe, and th selling to all the regional markets, uh, uh, South Mediterranean, as well as Eastern Europe. Brands. All brands. Hyundai has, Toyota has, Coach uh, Ando Fiat, uh, Ford has. They just, Ford just built a, fa a factory of 300,000 cars two years ago. South Africa, yani, uh, we all know Toyota is there, everybody is there. All those players just did it while we were sleeping. But I do not want to frustrate the people. What did Egypt achieve during the last 50 years in the automotive manufacturing? First of all, we have successfully created an automotive feeding industry covering 45% local content, which today many of them are successfully exporting to Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and global play, play, very, very important and prestigious global players. Yeah. Second, it has gained the credibility to the Egyptian perception, Egyptian consumer perception. Today, no one thinks while buying a car, is this car locally made or imported? And there is no differentiation, because really, there is no quality difference. But we have a challenge. Or before talking about the challenge, why didn't the industry evolute <laughs> what, what prevented the industry from evoluting during the last 50 years? First of all, no automotive manufacturing succeeds without a strong domestic market. And no strong domestic market happens without a strong GDP growth and increasing income per capita. Because there is a critical mass. You have to reach a certain level of income per capita and disposable income so that the demand for automotive grows. Let me give examples. South Korea, they have the government sustained an, a GDP growth rate of 10% plus for 25 years. At a certain point, the automotive demand boomed, and although the population of South Korea today is 42 million, their total domestic market demand is 1.5 million cars. While we are 90 million, and our total domestic demand is 300,000 cars. So, because we did not do the right job in developing the economy, we constrain or the demand for automotive got constraints. And in big businesses like this, it takes two to tango. The investor on his own cannot do it. It has to be a joint effort, effort between the country or the government and the investors. So the, the government has to provide a strong economic growth in order to succeed the industry. Second, the regulator, which is the government, didn't do his job. They started with a 40% minimum local content re requirements. And 20 or 25 years later, they woke up for five minutes and they said, make it 45. But during the last 25 years, the regulator did not push us 
to do more. So what was happening in South Korea was that the government was sustaining strong economic growth and in the meantime, the government was pushing the investors or the manufacturers every other year to increase their local content, to increase their spending on R&D and innovation and so forth. But the government, in our case, didn't do its, its job. What is the challenge this industry is facing today? This industry has costed the Egyptian government something like 100 billion Egyptian pounds in terms of support. Because basically it is built on preferential custom treatment, so the automotive assembler is getting a discounted uh, uh, custom rate. This discounted custom rate has costed the government during the last 50 years over 100 billion pounds. But today, with the implementation of the free trade agreements, this discounted custom rate is becoming higher than the custom rate of a car coming from Morocco, because basically the car coming from Morocco doesn't pay any custom. So, the free trade agreements. So today, Agadir, so, and the European community and the Turkish products are today paying half the custom duty of an imported car. And after exactly uh, 50 days or uh, 40 some days, 1st of Jan next year, the, the, they will be paying 40% of the custom duty. And four years down the road, it's going to be zero. The profitability of the assemblers is eroding or some of them now are losing money. While we all know that Egypt has the opportunity because today the market volume makes it economical, it is viable to transform the industry from assembly to manufacturing, but this entails investments of billions of dollars per, com per, per factory. How can the investor invest billions if he is not making money in his current business? We, I think that Egypt has the opportunity because it has the, 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 the base, the, the, the ecosystem for component manufacturing to make it. It has the volume and it has the uh, skills. But what is missing is the will at the government side. Currently, those regulations, or what we call it, the automotive manufacturing strategy is being discussed, uh, has, has been already approved by the economic committee of the government, and is being discussed at the cabinet. I really wish to see the government uh, 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 alert and making the right decision. At the end of the day, this is for the country because basically I am a trader. <laughs> so I care nothing. If they continue sleeping, I will go back to trading and I will avoid investing billions of dollars. If, if they wake up I'm very happy to invest the billions of dollars and take the headache of building a new industry in this poor country. At the end of the day, being a national guy, I really wish they do it because I think a deci decision like this is one of maybe five or six decisions which can build this country. Those are the challenges of our in industry. It's basi basically related to the government. We want them to wake up. I, I want to visit the place Salah was uh, visiting last week. <laughs> <laughs> they are really asleep. Yani, I think that they are as if, as if they are sitting in a, in a club, in a terrace, and talking uh, nice talks and not making decisions. And it is damn frustrating because I really wish to see 
my grandchildren living in this country a hundred years later while this country is prosperous rather than going to do business somewhere else. Thank you.